change the real estate. In 1964, there was an earthquake in Alaska that dropped sections of neighborhoods down for 40 or 50 feet. I was at Turnigan Heights I'm preaching up there. A couple, I'm going up there again this September to, to uh, Anchorage, Alaska. The uh, incredible damage done just in a few seconds to that community. When Mount St. Helens blew its top, the whole north side of the mountain slid down into the valley. My sister lived up near there when it happened. This uh, whole top of the mountain slid off to the side, uncorked the volcano, and steam and ash came shooting out of the volcano at about 100 miles an hour. This ash cloud covered the countryside. My sister got about six inches in her yard. Sixty-some people died as a result of Mount St. Helens blowing all this ash and steam all over the neighborhood. Some of the ash landed in New York City. Most of it landed in this pattern you can see here on this map. Mount St. Helens, the day of the devastation, there was pyroclastic flows that flowed where the red uh, is indicated there, mud flow deposits where the brown is, debris avalanche deposits, lateral blast, just a blast of steam and uh, energy coming out, knocked trees down in the light brown area there. And Mount St. Helens was a small volcano by volcano standards, nothing like Krakatoa in Indonesia. As the swirling mass came down the mountainside, it automatically sorted into layers. This mud flow flowing down the mountain covered up blocks of ice that were blown off the volcano when the eruption took place. Here's a semi half buried in mud. It blew enough mud out that everybody on earth can have a ton of it. It would fill a 10 cubic yard dump truck every second, 24 hours a day for 600 years. That's how much mud was moved out of that volcano. As the mud flowed down, it flowed over blocks of ice that were as big as a house because they were blown off the volcano. It used to be covered by glaciers, beautiful, beautiful mountain. These blocks of ice under this hot mud exploded, making erosion pits. This happened in a few seconds. Now, some teacher is going to bring his kids here someday and say, boys and girls, you see this erosion along the side of this pit? This took millions of years. <laughs> uh, no teacher. My daddy saw this happen. took about 50 seconds. The landslide of May 8th buried the river and the highway, highway to Spirit Lake to an average depth of 100 feet. It also buried most other drainages in the 23 square miles of the upper Toodle Valley and plugged the river's mouth. For 22 months, the water had no established path to the lower waterway. Then on March 19, 1982, an eruption melted a large snowpack that had accumulated in the crater over the winter. The waters mixed with loose material on the slopes of the mountain created an enormous mud flow. In nine hours, while no one watched, happened overnight, the mud flow carved an integrated system of drainages over much of the valley and reopened the way to the Pacific Ocean. The drainages included at least three canyons 100 feet deep. One is nicknamed the Little Grand Canyon of the Toodle because it's a 140th scale model of the Grand Canyon. The water was backed up behind the mud slide. When it got too deep, it went over the top, carved out canyons in a hurry. One canyon is 1,000 feet wide, 140 feet deep happen in a few hours. Once water starts going over a dam, it'll erode out things very, very quickly. You've got one right near here, uh, Grassy Valley, uh, north of Dayton, Tennessee, where the water goes, all the whole area drains down into a big hole and then comes out a few, uh, probably eight miles away in a cave in, not too far from Dayton. I went spelunking in there with Kurt Wise, who teaches up at Bryan College. We went in that case, spent a whole lifetime, or many years studying this. this. This used to be a cave that went probably all the way down to Chattanooga area, and it's now all collapsed back. Just about five miles of it is left is all. If you go to um, Georgia, south of Columbus, Georgia, there's uh, in a town called Lumpkin, Georgia, there's a huge uh, canyon area there. It's a state park. This great big canyon area started as a result of, they think, of the Methodist church not putting gutters on their building back in 1830, and it started causing a little gully, and the gully got bigger and bigger and bigger, and now it's several hundred acres of eroded ground, started it since 1830. When you go down, to the, in, when you go down into the canyons near Mount St. Helens, you will see erosion. Uh, it was incredible there, and it has, the sides of the canyon are stratified, nice neat layers. They say, now wait a minute, all this mud flowed in here at one time, why is it stratified? Well, because moving mud automatically stratifies. Get a jar of dirt, add some water to it, and shake it up and set it down. It settles into layers for you very quickly. At the bottom of that big canyon is a little tiny creek called the Toodle River, about from me to the TV right there, 20 feet wide. 
That little river did not make that big canyon, okay? And that little river at the bottom of the Colorado of Grand Canyon did not make the Grand Canyon either. <laughs> it was formed by a lot more water than that. So the textbooks are lying to you when they say that river made that canyon. Mount St. Helens, when it blew, also blew down bazillions of trees all over the neighborhood. Trees were blown down. It was unbelievable how many trees were blown down. They blocked up rivers. Uh, just incredible damage. You can see the huge semis here next to those giant trees out there in Oregon and Washington State. The trees were hauled out as many as they could. They hauled out thousands and thousands of truckloads of trees and just rescued about 10% of the wood. So many trees were blown into Spirit Lake that you can actually walk across the lake. 2,000 acres of floating wood on the lake, on Spirit Lake. Scuba divers went under this floating log mat and noticed something very interesting. Some of the trees are floating in the upright position. They're getting waterlogged. The root end's going to sink down. As they're floating in the upright position, they slowly sink and stick in the mud at the bottom. Hmm. Many of the trees in Mount St. Helens, in the Spirit Lake there area, are already being covered by sediments and beginning to petrify. And it just happened 20 years ago. Oftentimes, all over the world, petrified trees are found in the vertical position, petrified, standing up, running through multiple rock layers. The flood is the only explanation for that. We cover much more on that on videotape number four about petrified trees in the standing position. When that petrified tree falls down, it's going to break up into logs. I don't know if you ever cut down a tree for firewood or not, but when you cut a tree down, it does not break up into logs for you automatically. How many notice that phenomenon when you cut the tree down? Okay. It had to happen when the tree was petrified standing and then fell over as the dirt eroded away from it. Scuba divers here are going under this log mat to see what's going on. The logs are bouncing into each other as the wind blows around, and they're knocking all the bark off. At the bottom of Spirit Lake, there's a layer of bark about three feet thick. If it gets buried by any more debris, it's going to turn to coal. Atheists say, well, it takes millions of years to form coal. No, it doesn't. Coal can be formed in a few hours. There have been many experiments done where they form coal very quickly. During the flood, you'd get log mats as big as Texas floating around where lots of insects could survive for the whole flood, by the way, where a human could not. Insects could survive a flood outside the ark. But these log mats will float around and they're going to leave behind a debris trail. It's interesting, coal is nearly always found in layers, seams, coal seams, like in Kentucky or Illinois. I debated Jeannie Scott, the president of an atheist organization, and she said there are 80 layers of coal in the Midwest. She's right. She said, if you look at the amount of coal in the world, the entire biomass or all the plants of the world today could not, be, could not form that much fossil fuel. She's right again. She said, don't you see, there had to be a lot of time to make all this coal. No, she's wrong about that. What there were was big log mats floating around during the flood. They would drift back and forth with the tides and the wind, and they would leave behind debris trails separated by sediments, and then debris trails of, of logs and wood and bark. And you can get 80 layers of coal in one flood. There's a coal mine in Montana. The coal is 200 feet thick and covering 10,000 square miles. In the roof of one coal mine, they find dinosaur tracks. They're digging out the coal and they look up at the ceiling and there are dinosaur tracks in the ceiling. Well, during the flood, the dinosaurs were walking around probably in shallow water, stepping on all these de this debris, this rotting wood, and left their tracks behind. It got filled in by sediments right after they got there. Petrified trees in uh, um, Alabama are standing up, running through two different coal seams. Oftentimes, coal seams, go, you dig along for a while, and pretty soon they come together, branching coal seams. Absolute proof they formed very quickly. Not millions of years different in age, okay? This coal mine in Montana, 200 feet thick, coal. And human artifacts are found in coal from time to time. Here's a bell found inside a lump of coal. Here's a vessel found in solid rock, supposed to be 600 million years old. A lady in Illinois broke open a lump of coal. There's a gold chain inside, 10 inches long. A carved stone found in uh, Iowa in a coal mine. Here's an iron pot found in a coal mine in Oklahoma. Here's the sole of a shoe found in Nevada inside a piece of coal. The Bible says the waters assuaged or sank down, and the waters returned from off the earth continually.